Hi, guys. Do me a favor. Let's turn together to the Gospel of Mark, uh, chapter 11. If you didn't get a chance to fill out a prayer request or to engage in online giving, just want to encourage you, you can do that anytime on the app or on our website. So the stage decoration is for Kids Bible Camp. Looks pretty cool, huh? Yeah. I'm loving it. It's always exciting seeing hundreds of kids gather who are coming to faith, growing in their faith, to see God's faithfulness with the next generation. So I want to encourage you guys, if your kids haven't signed up yet, this is for elementary age, and you can sign up. Even now, there'll be a sign-up table out in the foyer, or if you'd like to volunteer, you can still volunteer. There's plenty of opportunity, so it'll be evenings, and I'm excited to see you there. So if you haven't already, let's turn to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 11, as we continue our studies through the Gospel of Mark. And as you're turning there, how many of you like roller coasters, amusement parks, carnivals, and the like? Yeah, the youth pastor types put two hands up in the air like they just don't care. Well, I have never been a big fan of roller coasters. Don't don't really like the heights. If you spend as much time as close to the ground as I do, you probably wouldn't either. But you know, that, that whole thing, when you go to a true amusement park like a Disneyland, a Magic Mountain, there's a certain degree of confidence in the technical engineering ability of the park provider. There's a confident trust that you're not going to get injured or significantly injured. And then there's that experience when you go to a carnival and it's just sketchy. Like you get in, in this seat and you look and there's like chain links holding this seat to a tower that's going up higher and higher. I mean, I've had this experience where I'm looking at the chain links. I'm really, these things are rusted. And, and then I'm looking at the guy who, who took my ticket and he's not, you know, eliciting a high degree of confidence on my part. And I'm in North County, San Diego at the Del Mar Fairgrounds as this tower is going up and swinging I'm thinking, if this thing breaks, will I be launched into the ocean and survive, or am I going to crash on land, you know? So, (laughs) the question of confidence, faith, where are we putting our faith? As a nation, our our currency says that, that we are trusting in God. Now, that's a wonderful thing to place on our currency, but is that actually what's going on? You see, faith is only as good as the object it is placed in. And our tendency is a culture, and the culture certainly influences how we as followers of Jesus think and behave. And our tendency in our culture, and and we're not necessarily protected from that way of thinking, although we are followers of Christ, is to place our confidence in our self, in our society, in science, in family, in friends, and finances. And those things are going to disappoint. Not only will they disappoint in this life, but they cannot deliver what only God can deliver, which is eternal life. Eternal life doesn't simply speak to a duration of life. Eternal life is speaking of a quality of life. It is the life that God intended for us to enjoy with him in this life and the life which is to come. It is a quality of life that provides a sense of contentment despite our circumstances. And nothing else in this world can deliver that. Only God. That is why Jesus, in this portion of Scripture, in Mark chapter 11, will tell us at verse 22, have faith in God. Now, as you contemplate the question, having faith in God, you might be here and you might be going, yes, I have faith in God. But so to speak, as you contemplate that amusement park analogy, the carnival analogy, and you're standing in line, are you willing to get on the ride? Are you willing to trust him in that that adventure? Or are you thinking like, there's gotta be an exit somewhere that I can get out of this thing? Or do you trust him? You see, those who trust in God are going to discover contentment in this life and the life to come. 
And let's discover that together. We're in Mark chapter 11. I'm going to begin reading at verse 15. I'm going to ask you, if you would, to follow along silently as we take a look through the first uh, five verses. So they came to Jerusalem, and Jesus went into the temple, and he began to drive out those who bought and sold in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. And he would not allow anyone to carry wares through the temple. Then he taught, saying to them, Is it not written, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations? But you have made it a den of thieves. And the scribes and the chief priests heard it and sought how they might destroy him, for they feared him because all the people were astonished at his teaching. And when evening had come, he went out of the city. Let's pray. Father, would you just open our eyes that we would see you, open our ears that we could hear from you, open our hearts that we would receive from you, that we would grow to represent you better today. Father, we trust that you're going to speak to us now. We thank you for gathering us together in this place and being here with us. We don't want to take any of that for granted. It is a gift from you, Lord. So do what only you can do now. Transform us, we pray, and we ask this now in Jesus' name. Amen. So the subject we're going to consider is Jesus purifying the temple and Jesus' authority question. Jesus purifying the temple and Jesus' authority question. And really the object that I believe God intends for us today is that we would have faith in God. That we would have faith in God. Now as Pastor Chris taught us from the first 14 verses, we see that Jesus has approached Jerusalem and for the very first time he received worship as the Christ, as the Messiah. Wonderful teaching from Pastor Chris. And then taught us about Jesus cursing the fig tree. That there was this fig tree that had all these leaves and that type of fig tree should have had fruit. The leaves being present was a symbol that there would be fruit on the tree. But as Jesus approached approached, there was no fruit. And Jesus cursed the fig tree. It's the only time in his whole earthly ministry that he ever cursed anything. And it wasn't that he was hangry. It was a symbol. You see, in the Old Testament, frequently Israel, the Jewish people, is referred to as the fig tree. So here was this religious activity on the exterior leaves among the Jewish people, but they lacked true faith to recognize their Messiah and yield to him. Also, the fig tree, you might recall in Genesis chapter 3, that after Adam and Eve's rebellion, they tried to cover the consequence of their sin, their awareness that they were now naked with what? Fig leaves. Now, it's interesting, by the way, that sycamore fig tree that's referenced there produces an oil that is somewhat toxic to human skin. It causes irritation, which I just think the irony, that's what they covered themselves with. But putting that aside, God has such a wonderful sense of humor in so many ways. The cursing of the fig tree shows us that we cannot cover the consequence of our sin apart from God's intervention. It shows us that God desires to bring fruit from our lives, spiritual fruit, rather than simply outward appearance, and we're going to discover how. First, we see Jesus purified the temple. So he has approached Jerusalem, a walled city in ancient days. There's still a walled city of Jerusalem, but as they enter into the city. Now they go up to the Temple Mount. We say it verse 11 and 12. And as Jesus surveys the scene, you, you've got the temple, which in and of itself is a relatively small structure. And inside are all implements of, of worship. It is adorned with symbols such as a golden lampstand, the menorah, table of showbread. There is an ark of incense where incense would be offered on that altar as a symbol of prayers ascending. Behind a curtain would be the holy place, the Ark of the Covenant, where God would meet in the mercy seat and be manifest among his people. And only priests could enter into the temple. The general worshipers gathered in the courtyards outside of the temple. And it's hard for us to get oriented towards that 
kind of idea in our understanding of the church assembly, where we come into the building. So in the courtyards, it's massive during the time of Jesus because of the expansion under Herod the Great. And in these great courtyards, you've got these merchants who have set up. So you've got people who are selling animals. That animals were offered as part of the ritual sacrifice for the Passover, as Pastor Chris explained to us. The city is just mushroomed with pilgrims coming from all over Israel proper, but all over the Roman Empire, returning to observe the Passover feast. And it's one of three week-long feasts on the Hebrew calendar where all observant Jews come to Jerusalem to worship. So it would be Passover at the beginning of spring at the barley harvest. Fifty days later, it would be Pentecost at the coming in of the wheat harvest. And then in the fall, there would be the Feast of Tabernacles. The Feast of Passover celebrates God's deliverance of his people, the Jewish people, from their bondage in Egypt. God famously directs Moses to go to Pharaoh and says, thus says the Lord, let my people go, right? That's, that's familiar language to many of us. If we've seen a Bible movie, we've seen that language with Moses, whether it was Charlton Heston or another Moses. But I like the book better, right? Here's why. Because Moses doesn't say, let my people go in Exodus 5.1. What God says for Moses to say and the message that Moses delivers is let my people go that they might worship me. It is not simply deliverance from our bondage. We're being set free from our slavery, whether it was slavery in Egypt or slavery to sin, so that we can be set free to worship God. Amen? So Jesus comes upon this scene, and the animal sacrifices were being sold to those who had traveled and now were going to engage in this ritual sacrifice. There were also sellers of doves that were told. So if you were too poor to afford a sheep, afford a, a lamb that you would offer to God, the poorest of the poor could offer a pigeon, a, a dove, as a sacrifice to honor God. And there were also money changers that were there. So every year at the Passover, people paid their annual temple tax. It was a half shekel of silver. So people would exchange Roman coins for the half shekel of silver, and the money changers charged a fee. So all of this merchandising that was going on in the selling of animal sacrifices at an exorbitant price the selling of doves at an exorbitant price, the conversion so people could pay their temple tithe. All of this exorbitant interest, all these exorbitant fees were extorting worshipers, which is horrible, but especially when it was those who were the poorest of the poor who had come to worship God. And they were being extorted. And so Jesus, with righteous indignation, Godly anger starts turning over the tables. Can you just imagine this scene? It's an estimated one to three million people in the city. Most of them have gathered on the Temple Mount, which is the place where all of the epicenter of meeting with God and religious worship is taking place in connection with the Passover. And here's Jesus turning over the tables. What a scene! Like, it'd be on CNN, it'd be on Fox, it'd be on Al Jazeera. I mean, you could just imagine, this is made for TV, made for big screen drama. And it's all righteous indignation. What Jesus is doing is removing obstacles to worship. Obstacles to worship are removed by the faithful. So Jesus doesn't just engage in this scene and leave it there. It says at verse 17, so he began to teach them. And I think it's so important that we just look at that. It doesn't say that he was so upset that he started screaming at them. Look what it says there, verse 17. He began to teach them. He recognizes that they have a misunderstanding of worship, and he wants to correct their understanding so that their attitude and their actions can align with the heart of God. So he begins to teach them. He doesn't scream. He, he's not histrionic with these big gestures, pounding things. 
just begins to talk to them. Talk to them in a way that they can understand, that they can discover that God's love, God's graciousness, God's patience, God's forbearance, and then respond to that love. And so then he quotes verse 17 from Isaiah. It's Isaiah uh, chapter, what is that chapter? Let me, let me find it here because I know it's in my notes and you might want to write it down. It's in here. Oh, it's Isaiah 56 at verse 7. He says, my house is to be a house of prayer, but you have made it into a den of thieves. Now he says this, and he quotes from Isaiah. And this is important for you guys to see, because in the original Hebrew of Isaiah, the word that we translate prayer, my house is a house of prayer, is tefillah. Now tefillah could be prayers on behalf of yourself, supplications. So God wants his people to gather and make their requests known to him. It can also be intercession, which is prayers on behalf of another. That that as we gather our prayer requests, as we intercede to pray not only our own needs, but those of others, this is something God delights in because prayer shows our dependence upon him and it shows our devotion to him that we trust that God cares, and we can cast all of our cares upon him. But tefillah could also be songs that are are prayers. So the psalms, the hymns, spiritual songs are all prayers set to music. God is teaching them, Jesus is teaching them about what the worship experience should be. God delights for his people to worship him in spirit and in truth. God gathers his people to be uniquely with them as they learn from him, as they pray to him, as they express love and adoration through praise in song to him. Amen? And so Jesus wants his people to understand. That's why we do what we do here at the church. You know, at times it it can seem very ritualistic. In other words, in a little bit of time, I will conclude this teaching. I will close in prayer. I will pray as everyone closes their eyes, including me. Then we'll open our eyes and the worship team will be here. It's like church magic. How did that happen? They just appeared. And and we'll sing a certain number of songs before the teaching, a certain number of songs after the teaching. Generally, we provide an opportunity for you to pray using the app or, or any other means you choose to so that we can gather those prayers. And then we type them and distribute them to literally hundreds of people here who have promised to pray over your requests, all of them or part of them. And it's an opportunity for us to be what God's called us to be, a house of prayer, worshiping God because we're declaring our dependence on him. And our devotion to him. Now at this teaching, Jesus' people should think for a moment. Does my life align with this? Similarly, those who were misaligned, whether it was those engaged in the selling of sacrifices at an exorbitant price, the money changers, or the religious leaders, should have heard these words... And yielded to Jesus. But it says in verse 18 that that the religious leaders then sought to oppose him. And it says why? Because, look at verse 18. They feared him because the people were astonished at what? It's open book. His teaching, right? Now, what would you expect it to say there? You expect it to say they were astonished by what Jesus just did in turning over the tables and driving out those who had turned the Temple Mount into a bazaar. It it looked like a, a farmer's market, people selling stuff, what should have been a holy place. And they were astonished, not at what Jesus did, but what Jesus said. Remarkable. Jesus' teaching is amazing. Just reading the Sermon on the Mount, if we could just get chapter 5, 6, and 7 in Matthew's gospel and live it, our world would be turned right side up. His teaching is amazing. 
And what he wants us to know is that he gathers us. How good does it feel for us to gather together to worship God coming out of a pandemic that apparently, you know, we're, we're still navigating it in this country and certainly globally. But to be able to gather, I was speaking with Linda before the service in the foyer, and she said, it feels so good just to gather with others and, and learn together and fellowship and worship together. And then she was telling me how being involved in a small group during the pandemic was such a game changer because of that encouragement. We are not meant to do life alone. We are meant to do life in community with one another and with God. Amen? Amen. And this is what Jesus is teaching us. The faithful gather to learn, to pray, and to worship together. If you want to know what true faith looks like, there is a heart's desire to gather with others, to learn from God, learn of God, to worship him, and to grow as a person of prayer. And I recognize that prayer is difficult, right? Uh, maybe you've had this experience where you get involved in a, a small group and week after week goes by, and you want to pray out loud you know, like others are, are praying, and, and yet you're not comfortable yet. And week after week goes by, maybe month after month, and then God just inspires you. Share what's on your heart. Share what I put on your heart. And, and you pray, and it's just so empowering. The, the enemy of men's souls doesn't want us to pray, and everybody in your group is like, that was awesome! Because we, we should be a people of prayer. We're God's people. This should be natural to us. Birds aren't thinking about flying. Like, whoa, what are the wind conditions here today? And is it safe to fly? You know, fish aren't worried. Oh, oh my gosh, look at the contamination in this water. They just do it. Because that's what God made them to do. He made us to be a people of prayer. And that's what we should be doing. Amen. Second lesson that we learn about faith is the lesson of the withered fig tree, beginning at verse 20. Now in the morning, as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. And Peter, remembering, said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree which you cursed has withered away. So Jesus answered and said to them, have faith in God. For assuredly, I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believe that those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. Therefore, I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them, and you will have them. True faith in God trusts Jesus to do great things, despite obstacles. True faith in God trusts Jesus to do great things, despite obstacles. So now they leave Jerusalem, and as they're going out, they walk past this fig tree that the day before Jesus had cursed. And this fig tree is now completely shriveled up, withered. It is supernatural. And Peter, seeing the fig tree, points it out to Jesus at verse 21. Lord, the, the fig tree that you cursed, look at this thing. It is all shriveled. It's all withered up. And then Jesus responds at verse 22. But it says that Jesus said to them. Peter made the observation like, Lord, check this out. Look at the fig tree that you cursed. And then Jesus said to them. In other words, he wants all of his disciples to understand this, including you and me. Amen? This was, wasn't just a lesson for Peter. Like, Peter, calm down a second. What seems impossible to you should be happening supernaturally, naturally in your life. Here's the key. He says, have faith in God. Verse 22, what, what seems impossible, God can do impossible things. He's God. You can trust him. Wow. And then Jesus goes on. He, he's just explained that his people should be a house of prayer, and now he's helping us to understand the power of, of prayer. And so he says, uh, verse 23, he's talking about faith that moves mountains. He said, if, if you pray and you believe and you say that this mountain be cast into the sea, it will be removed. Now, first of all, he's not talking literally. Like, I've tried to make the ascent up Mount Whitney twice, and I have failed within 500 feet on two occasions, and it's horribly humbling and demoralizing, and I, I'm confessing it to you here, and just that I'm 
was so proud that it became humbling. Um, but I assure you, I, I prayed vehemently, God, remove this mountain, and it was still there. Um, well, you just didn't have enough faith, brother. Okay. So, <laughs> mountains in Jewish literature are a metaphor for obstacles. For example, the prophet Zechariah, the second to the last book of the Old Testament. Zechariah is God's messenger to encourage God's people to rebuild their temple after the Babylonian conquest. And in the fourth chapter of Zechariah, we read at verse 6, Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. And then continues on, This mountain shall become a plain before Zerubbabel, the governor at the time. This obstacle of rebuilding the temple when there was so much opposition, so much hardship, so much difficulty that it seemed impossible. Why even start? This is more than we can do. God says, it's not your strength. It's by my spirit. You do it and the mountain will be leveled. The mountain will be removed and that temple will be erected and Jesus enters into that temple. Hallelujah. So what God is saying here is not literally that physical mountains are going to be tossed into the Pacific. What Jesus is encouraging us is to understand here this principle. So this is not a promise at verse 23. Whatever you ask, God is going to deliver. In other words, I'd love to go home and find a Pegasus in my garage. Like my Mazda 3 wasn't there and instead I had a Pegasus. And... and that would just be cool. I, I wouldn't care what color it was. Like, you know, black, white, charcoal, gray. It would just be so cool to have a Pegasus that you could just fly. Oh, my gosh. Right? Like, no matter how much I might pray and trust that's going to happen, I'm going to open the garage door, and there's going to be a Mazda there. No, it's not Mazda that I'm bagging on. It's just it's not a Pegasus. Okay. So... This is not a promise that whatever you ask, if you believe, God's going to deliver. It is a principle. For example, the Apostle Paul, we read in 2 Corinthians 12, he prayed three times for this thorn in the flesh. Many believe that he was suffering from the symptoms of malaria, had problems with his eyes as one of the symptoms of malaria. And he's praying for God to heal him, remove this thorn in the flesh. And Paul prayed three times. And then God finally responded with the encouragement, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made manifest in your weakness. In other words, Paul, I'm not going to heal you, but it's going to be okay. And in your infirmity, in your weakness, my strength will be magnified. Now, it wasn't that the Apostle Paul didn't have enough faith, right? If the Apostle Paul didn't have enough faith, God help the rest of us. Amen? But there was a principle, and here's the principle, that when God has inspired you to step out in faith, you should have confident trust and believe that he is going to do great things, even though it might seem impossible. Now, with your permission, can I go over a couple minutes here, maybe two, maybe a little more? Okay. All right. I just want to give you a quick history lesson. So our, our church started in our living room 25 years ago. Karen and I moved here, didn't know a single soul. But we knew that God was calling us here to start a Bible teaching church, a Calvary Chapel church. And so that church started in our living room. It started to grow. We started to meet in a park. Uh, that group started to grow by the grace of God. And so we rented space in a shopping center on Arneal Road, a stone's throw away behind us here, literally just over the wall in the back parking lot. We started off with 600 square feet, then went to 1,200 square feet. Soon we were at 2,000 square feet. By the time we left there in about six years, we were renting over 10,000 square feet of space. Now, then one afternoon, got a call from the Moose Lodge that they wanted to sell the empty lot, which was located at 380 Mobile Avenue. This was an empty lot. We had a small church. There weren't a lot of resources. And we felt that God was calling us to purchase this land and develop this building. We had no 
business doing that, but God's in the business of doing amazing things for his glory. And, and so we, we get this land, begin the, the process of the development. I want to tell you, in the last 25 years, I've gone through three building projects as part of Calvary Nexus. We've never once had a building campaign. Isn't that just so crazy? Like, everybody's like, you should do a building campaign so that people will give. And I'm like, hey, uh, that might work, but if we don't ask people to give and we just trust that God will move on their hearts and God moves on people's hearts, wouldn't that be more honoring to God? Yeah, this, it always sounds spiritual in my head until I'm worried and God's saying, what are you worrying about? Three building campaigns, building projects. We've never had a campaign. Uh, then after this campus was established, we subsequently started a second campus on Lewis Road. We established a youth center. We started a community service project called Beyond Sunday where we mobilized this community to invest in over 10 thousand hours of community service to our community on an annual basis. Uh, recently, we, we have a vision to saturate our community with small groups. There's presently 65 small groups that are represented through the Calvary Nexus community. And now, most recently, many of you have started to hear that we are taking on an effort to impact, to love schools in our community, that we were, are going to adopt 10 public schools in this community to show the love of Jesus to kids and their families in this community with the hope that not only helping to meet needs, but kids will come to meet Christ as Lord and Savior along with their families. Now, the idea of a local, one local church engaging 10 public schools in a community, knowing somewhat of the context that, that there can be some um, let's say, obstacles to churches and schools engaging, all right? And doesn't that just seem like the craziest idea ever? Like, I've never heard of a church doing that. But if God puts something on your heart to do, you expect him to do great things, even though you can't figure out exactly how that's going to happen. Amen? This is what Jesus is saying. He's not saying that, that if, if you're just... Pray hard enough, God will give you a 99-mile-an-hour fastball. That's just not what's going on. Or you'll play the guitar like Chris and just shred. And that's not, not what he's saying. But also here, we want to see that, that true faith forgives, beginning at verse 25. And whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him, that your Father in heaven may also forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your trespasses. A test of our faith is the ability to forgive others. Those who have graciously received God's forgiveness through faith in Christ forgive others who have hurt them. Now, biblical forgiveness is not forgetting God never forgets anything that, he, he's, that we've done, right? God's not in heaven like, Gabriel, Michael, where'd I put the chariot keys? It's like, he doesn't forget anything. That's one of the attributes of being God. He's all-knowing. But he no longer holds it against us, seeking to avenge the wrongs against us through faith in Christ. Similarly, when we forgive others, we no one longer want to avenge the wrongs done to us. That doesn't mean that you have to be besties with somebody, but your heart softens towards them because you receive God's forgiveness and you recognize you did not deserve it, but it's a gift through faith in Christ. Those who have true faith are gracious, long-suffering, and forgiving. In 1 Corinthians 13, perhaps one of the best-known portions of Scripture, the love chapter, Paul says, if I had all faith that I could move mountains, sound familiar? But I have not love, I am nothing. So, faith recognizes the power of prayer, but it also recognizes the humility of love and forgiveness. They're both and, they come together. So, We've seen the lessons on the fig tree. Now let's consider Jesus' authority being questioned, beginning at verse 23. 
Then they came again to Jerusalem as he was walking in the temple. The chief priests, the scribes, and the elders came to him, and they said to him, By what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority to do these things? But Jesus answered and said to them, I also will ask you one question, then answer me, and I will tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John. Was it from heaven or from men? Answer me. And they reasoned among themselves, saying, If we say from heaven, he'll say, Why then did you not believe him? But if we say from men, they feared the people. For all counted John to have been a prophet indeed. So they answered and said to Jesus, We do not know. Jesus answered and said to them, Neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. Note this with me. True faith yields to Jesus. True faith yields to Jesus. So the religious leaders now come to Jesus and they ask him twice at verse 27 and 28, by what authority do you do these things? In other words, you've come into Jerusalem and you've received worship and there you were uh, turning over tables, driving out those who were selling goods in the temple mount, the tables of the money changers and those. So, By what authority are you doing this thing? Now, see this with me. They don't want to, it's not an inquiry to find what the basis of the authority is. They could care less. It's simply a trap. And here's the way the trap works. If Jesus says that his authority is from God, that he's the son of God, they say it's blasphemy and therefore he should be stoned. If they say that if he says that his authority is from men, then they say, look, we as the scribes, elders, and chief priests are the established authority in Judaism, and therefore our authority exceeds his. He's in violation. And they're thinking like, oh, this is perfect. We've got him. And then Jesus, with divine, perfect wisdom, once again turns the table. First he turns over tables, now he turns tables. And he says, I'll answer your question, but first you answer mine. They're like, sure, what is it? And he says, hey, John the Baptist, uh, was his ministry of God or was it of men? And they're like, dang, he's got us. Because there's thing like, man, if we say that his ministry is of God, then he's like, hey, John the Baptist pointed at me as Messiah. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Why didn't you believe him? But if we say of men, everybody here knows that John was a prophet of God, and so they're going to be against us. So they're like, mm, we don't know. And Jesus says, like, okay, well, since you didn't answer my question, I'm not going to answer yours. Now, Jesus doesn't need to respond to the question, what authority? Everything about his life and his ministry, and at this point we're now less than four full days from him going to the cross, his death and his resurrection, points to him as the Messiah. Everything that he does is fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy to prove that he's the Messiah. So he doesn't need to affirm it. His life is evidence beyond a reasonable doubt. But when you think about this question, if somebody says, who's Jesus to tell me what to do? Okay, so... Do you really want to know? Like, like, when you say that, who's Jesus to tell me what to do? Do you really want to know? He's God in the flesh. He's the perfect representation to humanity of who God is. And he's the one who reveals to us the way to experience eternal life. Now, when somebody says, who is Jesus? Are they doing it mockingly? Is it out of disdain? Or are they doing it out of curiosity? Who is Jesus? And, and why does he get to have authority in my life? And, and the way that you know that you have true faith is how you respond to Jesus' authority. Um, those who have true faith are constantly seeking to learn from Jesus to learn of Jesus, then to yield to Jesus and seek to imitate him. And most people in my experience who have a genuine faith recognize Jesus' authority in their life. They recognize biblical authority generally. So if you said, well, Pastor Bruce, where's authority in your life? Yes, I'm submitted to Jesus' authority. 
but I'm also submitted to a core pastor team at this church. I'm submitted to deacons and elders. I'm submitted to a board. And that is to protect me and to protect you so that I'm not doing something in terms of my teaching or saying something in terms of my teaching that is misrepresenting God to you. So if, if one person tells me I'm a donkey, like if one of you tells me I'm a donkey, I, I'm, I'm going to listen. But I, I might not buy into it. When five of you, or those I'm submitted to, say, Bruce, you're a donkey, I start looking for a saddle. I, I recognize that, that I'm not the one in charge. Jesus is in charge. And unless I'm under authority, I can't expect any of you to be under authority. And I'm not saying you have to be under my authority. I'm not suggesting this at all. This is not a power issue. What I'm suggesting to you is you need to find a local healthy church that is teaching truth about Jesus and recognize some sense of biblical authority in your life. Because if, if the best you got is Jesus is my homeboy, you know, I'm under his authority, chances are you're going to twist and pervert what that actually looks like so you can do what you want to do rather than seeking to do his will. That's what prayer is all about. Not our will on earth, but his will. So faith begins, and then faith is a growing process. So real quickly, I want to share with you three ideas on how we can grow in our faith in God that I hope you'll find practical. First, learn the Bible. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God, Romans 10, 17. Second, experience God. Time in prayer and solitude with God. Gather experiences and discover that God is faithful. We just studied in Mark chapter 9, father of a demon-possessed boy says, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. What does Jesus do? He doesn't say, well, we'll just go pray more. He heals his son. And so now his faith is increased. The more experience that you have with God, the more you're going to discover that he is faithful. You can trust him. Which brings me to the last idea here. Take steps of faith. Take small steps. Take big steps beyond your comfort level and discover God is faithful. Right? So for you... Uh, uh, step that might seem big or small is coming and gathering once again with other believers. And you've discovered that God is faithful. Getting involved in a small group, maybe a huge step of faith. Getting involved in serving others, maybe a huge step of faith. Just talking with people, engaging people, befriending people, maybe a big step of faith. Being part of a church's effort love a community through adopting every elementary school in that community. I think that's a big step of faith. But it's going to take a lot of little steps of faith for each of us to get involved to do that. Amen? But what we'll discover is that God is faithful. And what we will discover through that is that we are growing in our faith. And what we will discover through that is the contentment that we were searching for through our comfort was actually found in Christ. And that is why we should have faith in God as opposed to anything else that the world would offer. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we just uh, pray that you would increase our faith, that we would discover experientially, as well as intellectually, emotionally, spiritually, that we are to put our faith in you. Challenge us, Lord, in other areas where we have put our faith that are misguided. Direct us, Lord, how we can grow in our faith. I pray if there's anyone here who has not yet received you as Lord and Savior, that they would exercise the faith that you are giving to surrender their life to follow you, that they might lose their life to gain life from you. And if that's you right now, just in the quiet of your heart, let God know you're ready. And he's promised to forgive all the sin that separates you from God, promised to give you spiritual life, and promised to be with you.
for the rest of this life into eternity. And if that's you right now, rejoice as you pray. Father, we thank you for this gathering. We pray that we will continue to worship you, not only in song, not only in prayer, not only in study, but in our lives. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you guys. Thank you.